From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger Morris. It's Monday, September 11th. It's a controversial new industry being built right under our noses by a cast of characters who sound like they're straight out of an Agatha Christie novel. We're talking about deep sea mining. It's the last frontier on Earth to be mined for riches. Many argue that deep sea mining will benefit the environment. But others, like world-famous environmentalist David Attenborough, say that it's unthinkable to embark on this practice until its environmental impact is better understood. Today, journalist Sharon Groch on the privatization of the world's seabed that is happening behind closed doors. So Sharon, I had no idea until reading your incredible feature over the weekend that we are on the brink of a deep sea rush, essentially the oceanic version of the gold rush of the 1850s, except this one will be taking place 200 kilometers below the ocean's surface. And much of this is actually being done in the shadows, which I guess makes sense given that some of the main players in the area are not generally fond of ending up on the front pages of newspapers. <laughs> so take us to the beginning. How did you stumble on this story in the first place? Well, I was just looking to write a fun explainer on the deep sea. I wasn't even meant to be looking into the mining part. An intern and our explainer editor, Felicity, who have both actually studied international law, had already had a bit of a look at the strange regulatory setup overseeing this kind of coming mining rush. And I thought, man, that's a lot. I'll just add in all the cool science and the deep sea beasties like goblin sharks and giant squid. But I thought, you know, I better have a quick look. I'll do a drive by. So I'm a Across it. And I noticed that the main company that came up again and again at the front of the pack of the miners who are now pushing to open this frontier was run by an Australian, Gerard Barron. And I thought, that's kind of cool, you know, we're involved, go us. But then I realised Barron had also been one of the big financiers of Nautilus, which was that Australian startup with those grand plans to be the first in the world to mine the deep sea out in Papua New Guinea. But they went bust and cost the PNG government millions in lost investment. It was like a third of their healthcare budget, which is a lot for PNG. And I realised a lot of this old Australian crew at Nautilus were now popping up chasing metals in other parts of the world, especially in international waters, the high seas. There's not many companies because this is, of course, a new industry, but Australians are involved in heaps of them. So I had a look at what happened to Nautilus and how this all started. And this is where it gets really wild because I realised that it was wasn't really dead. So Nautilus had been taken over by a new company called Deep Sea Mining Finance, and they were having these secret talks with P&G, I realised, to reopen that old project and launch the world's first deep sea mine, only, you know, for real this time. When I dug out all the court records and spoke to people involved, I realised it was two guys who had been quietly financing Nautilus back in the day, an Omani billionaire named Mohammed Albawani and a sanctioned Russian oligarch, probably Russia's richest oligarch named Alisher Usmanov. So those two bought up the assets of Nautilus when it went bust and they created deep sea mining finance, which means the PNG government is now greenlining deep sea mining for a company partly owned or at least linked to this oligarch and his sanction companies. So I just went, what? I mean, I know I've (laughs) reported a lot on Russia and oligarchs. I'm sort of known as the oligarch girl at work. But even I did not expect to find an oligarch at the bottom of the deep sea trench here. (laughs) I mean, talk about a discovery. And so can you tell us about what all these people are hunting for? Because they're spending millions on environmental research and technology to hunt for this stuff at the bottom of the sea. So why do they want these precious metals, essentially, and just how hard is it to get a hold of them? Well, very hard, actually, because the deep sea is like space. It's dark, it's cold. The conditions here are really extreme. In fact, the guys who first went down the Mariana Trench, they used tech that went on to be part of the Apollo space missions. And scientists have gone down there in these little submersibles. Tell me, it is like being on another planet. It's really alien, shaped by different forces. Down there in the deep, there's said to be 
billions, if not maybe even trillions of dollars in metals. There's crusts of cobalt and other things that form really slowly on the sides of undersea mountains. There's these potato-shaped rocks called polymetallic nodules that form over millennia on the sea floor. They kind of basically form around scraps of shark teeth and other debris, the way a pearl might form, and they're packed with all kinds of useful metals. And then there's these really cool spires of copper and gold that form over these hydrothermal vents. And they're basically hot springs under the sea where all the hot water hissing out of the Earth's crust. It hits the cold ocean and it ignites all these chemical reactions. And the water actually smokes and glitters with the iron and the gold. This is actually where the metals are forming. They're made by the movements of the Earth's plates. So under the sea, they're super high yield. And miners say they're also cheaper to mine in the long run because once you build all the expensive new tech, you can just sort of move your ship from one site to the other. You don't have to set up a whole permanent mine. And people like the metals company and Barron argue it will actually have less impact to mine under the sea than on land because there the mines are eating into rain forest and sometimes they're using child labor in the Congo and things like that. So they say, look, if we're going to electrify the world for the clean energy transition, we need a bunch more metals. So instead of destroying what wilderness we have left on land, why don't we mine the deep sea, which is huge, it's untapped. I mean, metals company estimate that their haul from from their claim in the Pacific alone could electrify like 280 million electric vehicles, which is about the size of America's entire car fleet. I mean, it absolutely just boggles the mind. But what you've written about is that it's actually international waters, which is the real big deal in this space. So can you tell us about that? Yes. So the mother load is kind of in the high seas because the high seas cover about half the planet. And there's a big zone between Hawaii and Mexico that's said to hold more rare metals than all the reserves on land. But in international waters, you basically have to get a UN regulator to greenlight projects because the law of the sea says mining here has to be for the benefit of mankind and developing nations need to get an advantage. They basically, in the 80s, came together and said, we don't want it to be a free-for-all. So rich areas of seabed were set aside for poorer countries that maybe didn't have the money to develop the tech. Now the UN is finally close to actually opening mining here for the first time. And I realised that those same Australians that were behind Nautilus are now involved in many of the key companies lining up to be first. So, you know, Barron and, and all those guys. At Metals Company, which is run by Barron, they've partnered with Little Islands, Nauru, Tonga, Kiribati for their seabed claims. So they've now staked about half of the seabed that the UN regulator has allocated to developing nations so far. They've also attracted major financing and technology from this big private company called All Seas. All Seas now tell me they want to get into deep sea mining to get metals for the green energy transition like Barron. And I discovered as well well as a big stake in metals company, they have their own license for another area of seabed that hasn't been disclosed through a deal with Jamaica. So between Metals Co and All Seas, we're talking about sort of two thirds of the seabed that's been allocated so far for developing countries claimed by just two companies. So basically, experts have told me that, you know, letting nations partner with companies in this way to do the actual mining, it was meant to give little countries without the money to mine themselves a stake in all of this buried treasure. But in practice, it's the companies running the show. We'll be right back. So essentially what you're talking about here is the privatization of the seabed of some massive area on the globe. And it seems to be sort of being done in private. So who's regulating this space? So 
the law of the sea. You know, it was trying to do an extraordinary thing. Instead of business as usual, they wanted to, you know, divvy up the riches fairly. So they set up this little known regulator called the International Seabed Authority or the ISA. And they gave it extraordinary power because they didn't want to politicize mining and have countries fighting over contracts at meetings and things. But in practice, it means that the ISA's operational arm, this sort of secretive committee called the LTC, they've been left to decide who gets the licenses. So until recently, they could only give out licenses to explore. So they'd give licenses to countries and companies sponsored by countries to prospect big areas of seabed for metals, test their robot rovers, that sort of thing. But the LTC has repeatedly refused to hold open meetings to penalise companies for breaking the rules of those licences. And sometimes they won't even reveal who actually owns these companies. Meanwhile, while that's sort of happening, country delegates have, have been negotiating an actual mining code, basically the rules of the road, how to divvy up the profits, what kind of environmental damage thresholds they should set so mining can actually start. But then Nauru, which is partnered with Metals Company, they triggered this obscure rule that means the LTC can now, as of July, look at giving out commercial licences too. So people could actually start mining if they approve one. And if they do approve it, it'll be really hard for countries to vote down because of the weird setup of the ISA. Metals Company reckon that they'll apply next year. So there could be mining at the end of the year, maybe 2025, a lot of countries are really worried and they're pushing to rein in the power of the LTC, which may yet happen before anything is green lit. But it means that all of this has really just come to a head all of a sudden in the past few months. Okay, and so you've walked us through what some of the potential problems are in terms of small nations. I think one country stands to gain maybe 2% of whatever the yield is in terms of money from the metals that are found in its waters by linking with these companies. But beyond all of this, you've written that there's actually risks posed to our health as a result of the mining. So can you tell us about this? Yes, yeah, so these are really high stakes decisions. I mean, we don't really think about the deep sea. It feels as remote as space, but it's it's not. It's not like it's the night sky. It's actually a huge part of our planet. It drives the world's weather. It influences fish stocks. It's the world's biggest carbon sink. And we know actually very little about how it works because it is so remote. It's, you know, the last untapped wilderness. It's where scientists think life may have begun. They hope it might even unlock new frontiers of science. You know, maybe all the, the weird beasties in there could help us cure cancer or figure out how to reverse aging. But what scientists are worried about is that if we send down these robot rovers to sort of trundle along the sea floor and suck up the nodules, they're going to stir up these storms of sediment that could travel for, you know, up to about 100 kilometres. And they could really smother these really important ecosystems that do important work that matters higher up in the food chain. They're also worried that toxic metals and even radioactive particles could be released back by this process. I mean, you know, these nodules themselves, they are a little bit radioactive. Now, they're not the kind of radioactivity you have to worry about by touching them, but if they're ingested, it could be a problem. So scientists are saying, look, we only just figured out that that could be a thing. Let's do some more research. And you've got an about 800 plus scientists saying, let's just hold our horses here. Let's have a bit of a moratorium until more research is done. And I believe there's been some pretty big names too attached to the side of the argument that hey, 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 let's not rush things. Among them, world-famous environmentalist David Attenborough. Yes, and also Aquaman himself, Jason Momoa, is quite concerned too. Depends how you define expert, of course. <laughs> what has Aquaman said on the matter? <laughs> He's narrated some um, very compelling documentaries, actually, old Jason Momoa. But the companies sort of at the, the front of the race are saying, look, we've already done like years and years of research. We think we're good to go. And I, I guess the, the, the problem here is that there is an urgency to all of this. I mean, they're right when they say that we need metals to fuel the green energy transition. We know it's not happening nearly as fast as it should be. But on the other hand, our, our ocean is already under pressure. I mean, there's there's plastic, there's global warming, acidifying. It, there's, you know, 
these deserts of oxygen loss that are kind of creeping through the deep. And and there's all kinds of problems already facing the sea, let alone introducing mining when we don't know what the impacts will be. So people are saying, look, this is basically like the last untouched wilderness we haven't plundered. And it's really important for how our planet works. Let's just leave it alone until we figure out what the consequences could be. So th- this stuff actually does matter, even though it's it's down in the dark. And I think the world is only starting to really wake up to it now. Sharon, thank you as always for joining us. Thank you so much for wading in with me through all of that. I feel like I've gone down the Mariana Trench of rabbit holes here with this story. But how lucky are we? I mean, none of us knew about this previously, and it really is the next frontier. And I personally do not want to be eating radioactive fish. (laughs) Those three-eyed fish from The Simpsons. Maybe they're closer than we think. (laughs) That's right. Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Julia Carcatzel with technical assistance by Chi Wong. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening.